Greetings. My name's Guy Dornsey, and this is the show Change the World, where, as if you're a regular viewer, you'll know, I like to invite guests on who share my passion for big picture thinking, who understand some of the crises we're, on, we're in on the planet and the need to change. And I'm, my guest today is the Honorable Lana Popham, <coughs> um, our Minister of Agriculture. And for, for full disclosure, I should say also a personal friend. Yes, that's But I have true. contributed to your campaigns in the past. So we're fully on and board I'm with that. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs> So Lana was raised on Quadra Island in a do-it-yourself community where growing food, raising animals and harvesting from the sea were a way of life. Your interest in urban planning led you to UBC and a degree in geography, settled in Saanich, have your own farm, the Barking Dog Vineyard, organic growing, and then elected in 2009, serving in the legislature. So you have, what, eight years? This is, I'm in my ninth year as an MLA, yes. but eight years as training as right. so, uh, so, in opposition. So tell me, what is it like suddenly after eight years of all these ideas and things you want to do, now it's yours, now you're the minister. What does it feel like and what's it been like? Well, um, so it's a dream come true. Yes. It really is. And so I've been the critic for agriculture for, yes. I was for almost eight years. Yeah. And... Um, I was a farmer before that, so I came into politics because of farming and around trying to change policies for farmers. Yes. As a farmer and, you know, as being in the food world yeah. on the island, in so many cases it felt like farmers, especially young farmers, had to fight to farm and it's such an important job to do. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of all the things that were barriers and, you know, a, the group of people that we were with, I would say we were food security activists yes. and um, wanted to make it easier for farmers to, to be, take part. Uh, and it just didn't seem like it was working from the outside. Yeah. And so I thought, I got to go to the inside okay. and work my way back out. And so suddenly being in office, is it like a, a storm of excitement or is it you can get stuff done and you see stuff happening <clears throat> or is it too soon for that? Um, well, government works at a slow pace and so if you're an impatient person it can be um it's not frustrating but it, you just it you have to pace yourself as well yeah. and so you know you want to do things right so when you think of a legislative change when you're in opposition yes. you're like let's do it <laughs> um but then in government and as minister you have to make sure the legislation is you have to consult you have to make sure it's drafted properly yeah. you have to run it through your cabinet and so it's a slower process, but you, un you almost get a better understanding of why it, it's slower nice. once you're in that position. But I can tell you that it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's very challenging and the learning curve is steep, but um, <laughs> I love it. So let's assume you have got four years and the, yes. the, the NDP Green Alliance holds. After four years, what are the big things you would like to have achieved? Well, my mandate's very interesting and it's uh, quite simple, really, from a farmer's perspective. Yeah. So it's broken into three parts, but an overriding um, policy is around revitalizing the agricultural land reserve and making okay. it stronger. So I think that there's a general view that it hasn't been as strong as it could have been over the last 16 years and there has been opportunities that it's been eroded. Um, and so we're going to take a look at everywhere where we can kind of tighten it up yeah. and make sure that we've got it for future generations because it's been in place for over 40 years yes. and the idea when it was brought in, it was brought in for the future of food right. growing and the future's right now. <laughs> so if I'm right, the Agricultural Land Reserve or the ALR has two big goals, one to protect the farmland and two to grow more food on the farmland, right? Well, it's to protect farmland, increase production and also encourage farmers. Yes. So it has I, another part too. Because I meet so many young people who want to get on the land, can't afford to do so, would, yeah. and want to have a little small village and do horticulture together, yeah. but the zoning rules, they'd actually be putting more houses on and stuff like that. Is it possible that we might see the first small farm, small houses eco-village on farmland where everyone's growing food? I don't think it's impossible to see that for sure. Um, getting lots of uh, advice from people, from constituents from all around the province and yeah. how they would like to see uh, access to farmland increased. Yes. We have this amazing group of farmers called the Young Agrarians across yes. the province. Yes. And so they're at a position where they, they want to start farming but maybe can't afford the land to farm on. So they have continually brought to me the ideas around leasing uh, small yes. scale houses on farms. Um, and really, I think 
think we have to be open to all of that. We have been very uh, strict around housing development on ALR yes. in regulation and legislation. Uh, some of that, of course, if you apply to have an exclusion and you get it, the speculation on that farmland increases. Well, I and know. It, if, if you didn't have the ALR on the lower mainland, you'd have non-stop housing right through to Abbotsford. That's true, but given the 16 years, I think, which has uh, eroded the ALR, and mm. it's really created the atmosphere that the ALR is a uh, land bank for development in yeah. a lot of cases, we are lucky to have what we have left, but we really want people to consider it uh, highest and best yeah. use is food growing. And so how do you do that? You don't want large houses on farmland. Sure no. um, you want to make sure houses are sited properly on a farm, so not smack dab in the middle. That takes away yeah. the potential for farming. And so you might want to look at um, like a, a home plate where you're allowed to have your home and the accessory buildings for farms. Uh, Abbotsford or Chilliwack, Chilliwack just passed some bylaws that said you have to have your f house on the edge of the property. Yeah. And they've taken about, an, so if you own over 10 acres, I think it's an acre that you can use for everything else that you need to have on your farm. Perhaps that's a, a place for a small houses well, to... Ten ac one acre can easily have 10 small houses with a shared place that's for doing right. stuff together. You and can I've fit been them hearing that. about that. Yeah. And I think people want us to be more creative yes. around the opportunities for living on farms because I know as a farmer and watching my friends try and farm, you can lease farmland, but if you don't live on the farm, it well, changes you know, the way you, you farm. Have, you have to live on the farm. Yeah. So I put a proposal together a while back on farm villages. I remember it. And with specific rules to make sure that people living there are farming the land. And it's yes. not, it's otherwise it's a sort of a, a sneaky way for the realtors Absolutely. to get in there and, and, and alienate the land. Yeah. No, you want to make sure it's tied to active farming. Yes. And there, sure. there, are, there are legal mechanisms you can use yeah. to do that. Right? Yeah. And so I think we're open to anything right now. We're okay. going to be doing a consultation over Excellent. the next... Uh, eight months yeah. before we decide on any legislative changes, but I hope that you'll give me your input. Yes, because also in the past, if you think back to the before the industrial age, farmers always lived in villages which are always close to each other. And right. so it wasn't just the village and the farming, but it was the children growing up on the farm. It was the shared celebration. It was the children falling in love with the land. And that That's needs true. community. So well, there is a culture of agriculture. Exactly. You're yeah. bringing back the culture into that, and not just one that's lonely true. farmer on a tractor. Right. Treating the soil as something that's living and yes. feeding the soil to make healthy produce yeah. is something that's the way, it's a way of thinking in organic farming, yes. for sure. So, so I know as minister, you can't say anything clear, but I gather in Holland a while back, they had a proposal to put a tax on pesticides and fertilizers mm -hmm. and use the income to give to farmers doing the three-year transition oh, to organic. Interesting. Because mm -hmm. you can't suddenly go from non-organic to organic. There is a transition You have to phase. build the soil fertility up. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, the pesticide rules fall under Minister of Environment, right. and that's Minister Heyman. So you have to sit down with, with George Heyman. You Hayman do. You have to work between ministries, which, um, you know, I think... Uh, People consider that maybe that ministries work as silos, but in our government, we are pushing very hard to make sure that we're we're all communicating at all times because yeah. it really makes for much stronger governance if you do that. Because there was another story linked to this that I'm um, in Germany. You probably saw this. 75% of insects have been lost over the last 25 years in this area they've studied, and like mm -hmm. insects are the be all of farming. They fer they're yeah. pollinating everything. And so yeah, that biodiversity also, and is And that's so the use of, of pesticides again. The same stuff that's killing the bees. Right. So what can we do to protect the bees? In British I, well, I love bees, and so yes. when I first got uh, sworn in as minister, I was meeting all the amazing agriculture ministry staff, and they all said to me, we know one thing about you, you love bees. Yes. And so um, really looking at, at that, and again, working with the Ministry of Environment. Yes. So um, uh, obviously I've been quite well educated on the neonicocide issue, yes. and um, that is considered something that might be harming bees. Yes. And so I started looking into it and what it means to ban something like that. Is that federal or provincial? It is federal, but something came interesting came up in discussion. If you ban that particular pesticide, yes. there's one waiting that might be worse mm. just to replace it. Okay. So in opposition, it's very easy for me to say we should ban it. Yes. Now that I have to look into things much more deeply, I think um, it's more complicated than that. And you certainly don't want to change something and yeah. the effect will be worse. But the European Union is planning to ban the neonicotinoids. I can never get the word I right. know. We call them neonics. Neonics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the European Union, they're planning to do this, so they must be looking at the same problem. I think so. And so I haven't had any discussions um, in right. different regions, but I'm looking forward yes. to doing that. 
And does the same set of thinking apply to glyphosate? I mean, the sort of the... the, the that's the, a big discussion, the, too. The chemical that's written, that's wrapped into Roundup and the other yeah. pesticides that now is, is a possible carcinogen and, and doing harm. Yeah, you hear a lot about and that. People are campaigning to say ban, ban the glyphosate. Yeah, and as well. I've definitely got that correspondence. Right. And so, um, yeah, and I'm aware of it as I was an organic farmer. Yes, I'm very yes. aware of, of that situation. Um, I think that consumers have a, a very strong power to drive the way that things are done. And yeah. so as consumers become more aware of growing practices, I think farmers are able to adapt and you know, they can't adapt immediately, yeah. but there's interest in doing that. You just look at another issue that's come to me quite often is around um, cage-free chickens, yes. layers. Yes. Um, the chicken industry, they're quite progressive thinking, and there's a lot of interest in doing that, but of course they request, can we have some transition time? And yes. I think that's fair. So Sweden, I think, has banned caged chickens entirely now. Yes, well, so I don't Pippi, know how long the transition Pippi was. Pippi Longstocking, the children's author, right? was a big campaigner on it, yeah. which probably helped, right? Yeah, and so we, I, I definitely hear from people all the time, yes. but of course I have to take that to industry, right. and there's a lot of um, very interested uh, growers that want to embrace that, yeah. and then there's some that it comes down to financial means in in a lot of ways it takes uh, quite a, an investment to, to transfer into that type of growing yes. and so we have to look at what are the incentives okay. that government can do to yes. help do that because they're certainly interested in it because yeah. they hear it from their consumers yes what about the whole of the legislature serving organic food all the time. <laughs> you have a kitchen there, right? Some sort of We restaurant. do. We have a restaurant, and I've always had this dream that it would be a showcase for BC goods. And uh, so, yes. But to tell you the truth, I haven't had a second to even eat when I'm working down there. It's so busy. <laughs> but is it possible that they hmm. could have a sort of a purchasing mandate to either have all local food? You, Vic's doing a huge thing on we local have purchasing. A, that's true. And so one of the most exciting parts of uh, my mandate is called Feed BC. Feed BC. Yes, and so that is a procurement tell, policy. What is, what is, how how does Feed BC work? So it's a procurement policy and what we're going to do is encourage institutions like hospitals and long-term care to move the amount of uh, produce that they're buying, uh, processed um, primary products and processed products up to 30% in okay. their, their buying schemes. Yeah. So that sounds like 30%, that's doable. Well, I can tell you, if we had to do that right now, we couldn't do it. Well, we couldn't do it because we don't have the supply and we don't have the way of distributing it. Yeah. And we certainly don't have the processing set up. You, UVic got up to 75%. That's true, yes. But hospital is a different beast. And so mm -hmm. when you're looking at institutional buying, it's right. much different. But I can tell you that there's a lot of interest and yes. I think this is a game changer. Do they even, do they track the local components at the moment? Because even measuring- They do, this, although it's not, we don't, we don't have a way of getting that information right. currently, but we're just about to um, uh, announce, I don't know if it's, it, it's yeah. probably not till after the new, in the new year, but um, announce a pilot project that we're gonna do around uh, a hospital and right. a, a health authority that are very keen to yes. start doing this. You can't tell us which health authority. I can't, I can't give any details, but it's gonna be very exciting okay. because it will give us an indication of exactly, exactly how much right. is being consumed. But I can tell you in the lower mainland, yes. in the Southwest area with the health authorities there, they spend $50 million a year just on hospital meals. Wow. So if we could give that back to some of our communities in BC to be responsible for, yes. especially on the processing side, yes. we would see agriculture being used as an economic wow. driver in a way that it really hasn't had the chance yes. to do. Mm -hmm. And so once they have the way to, to track where the food comes, then it can be a, you can roll that. it out in, in every, every other hospital. Yeah, so there was a hospital up in 100 Mile that was serving fruit yes. cups that were imported fruit cups in the middle of our fruit season. And I thought that yeah. seems a bit crazy to yes. be doing that. Um, how, how hard would it be to have made in BC fruit cups to serve in the hospital So then system? the seniors' homes and residences could also sign up to Absolutely. Anywhere where that. the government is purchasing food right now is what we're looking at. Right. Once that gets in place, it's very easy for a private uh, yeah. companies to start doing the same thing because the distribution will so be So will set you up. have an award when, when, a, when a company, it, it could be private sector as well or institution, passes a certain threshold, Yeah. they get some big 
you well, turn we'll up. We'll get a, like a woohoo from the Minister of Agriculture. And a big bouquet of flowers That's to all right. their staff or something That's like right. that. That's right, a bouquet of carrots. <laughs> yeah, carrots, yes. Yeah. But, you know, I was thinking, um, is, this, is there any barriers to this type of processing? And there really is. We don't have a super supportive environment for increasing processing in mm. British Columbia. And so another part of my mandate, which is super exciting yes. as well, is the Food Innovation Center. And this is where uh, research technology happens around how do you increase processing? Right. How do you process certain goods? How yes. do you do startup companies? Yes. Um, and so this is sort of um, an incubator for that kind now of is, business. Is that under your ministry? Or the, it is. To, okay. It is. Oh, right. And so we're one of the only provinces that don't have a food innovation center right now. And so oh, right. all of our R&D money yes. from companies goes to different provinces and different oh, regions. Right. So where will it so, be based? Um, we think we're looking at the lower mainland, yes. but the most important part is that we'll have nodes out into rural BC. Okay. So there will be the opportunities to be able to connect to yes. the, the main part of the center in the lower mainland. But we have to have opportunities for rural BC to take part in the value-added processing market. So the process of trying to get more local food, will, will you'll <coughs> find out where the weak spots are when That's you haven't right. got a particular person and then invite yeah. the entrepreneurial community to get in there and make Absolutely. it happen. Absolutely. It's very exciting. So on just on uh, fruit cups or applesauce, I went yes. to a, a processing company in the Fraser Valley who makes fruit filling for pies, and they use a lot of apples. And I said yes. to them, um, could you ever make fruit cups for the institutional market? Yes. And they said, well, we use uh, apples from Washington right now. And I said, well, if the stipulation was that it had to be uh, processed with BC apples, would you do it? And they said, absolutely, we just haven't had a reason to do that. And so it's just about putting that incentive out there, yeah. making sure that the, the market is prepared for those sort of products and getting the distribution in place. And I yeah. think it's, it's gonna be the best. So another little story, this is, um, my wife Carolyn's been doing a whole training in holistic nutrition. And one of her students, um, her husband does food deliveries to schools in Port Alberni. And so nice. he's been briefed about holistic food and the importance of stuff. And he saw these apples which had stickers on them. He photographed the stickers and the stick and the apples are being sprayed with a bunch of they're imported from somewhere else outside the province. Yeah. They're from some commercial supplier and they're covered in poisons going into the schools through some supply chain that huh. is clearly not a local thing. Yeah. And I thought well, we should call CBC Marketplace and get a story on this one because right. clearly they their apple buying choices they're not able to they're get sourcing local. sourcing local. Well, somehow. we do have a great program in BC called Agriculture in the Classroom. And so okay. we do bring goods in that way. And the ministries yeah. of, of health and agriculture sponsor yes. that program. And it has to be from BC. So, right. but I didn't know about that other yeah. program. Yeah. yeah. So there's there's lots of opportunities. Yeah. But it, now that you bring up the idea of the sticker and where it's from. They can identify it, yes. Yes. So we are also super excited to bring out the Buy BC program, which was a marketing program right. for BC products that was in the 90s, very successful program. Yes. And um, I think 87% of consumers recognized the Buy BC logo at right. that point. While 16 years later, it got it got cut for partisan reasons. Yeah. 16 years later, we're bringing it back because consumers still recognize it. That, okay, wow. That's, that's the that's power impressive. of a good brand. That's impressive. Exactly. And so that was did a soft launch last month. Um, but we will have marketing materials available okay. for growers in BC. So it's very easy for consumers yes. to identify products that are grown in BC if that's what they want to choose. So what about local people organizing cooperatives to bring more innovation and tools? I gather some friends in the Comox Valley are looking at starting a, a cooperative mm. of that kind. Is that a good way for people to do things so that they're organizing their local community with all the bits and pieces needed for a strong agricultural economy? Yes, and I think that there's more and more discussion about the value of co-ops co yes. like that. And you know who one of the, the spokespeople right now who's traveling around the province talking about it is our good friend Corky Evans. Right. Right. Yes, okay. You're so one of your mentors, right? That's <laughs> for sure. He was a minister of agriculture back yes. in the 90s. And so, um, yes, and so he's very fond of that idea, and I'm looking forward to working with him okay, on those ideas. Right. Yeah. So out of left field, some people are concerned that with Victoria's sewage treatment, we're going to get sludge dumped on farmland. Mm. Happening or not happening? Well, I don't know, because that also falls under the Ministry of Environment yes. for those things. But the CRD has already been very clear that people do not want that yes, to happen. Yes, because it's, so, got, it's got drugs in it, it's got chemicals in it. Depending it's got on the type of, of treatment that's used, yeah. yeah. So um, it's, it is of concern, and I've watched it for years okay. go back and forth at the CRD, but that that falls under the, the Ministry of Environment. So if it came to Cabinet, you'd be, in the, you'd be sort of fighting to keep the farmland protected from contaminants? I think that we'd have to really look at what the agriculture 
community saying. Yeah. Um, they're obviously a main stakeholder. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know how it would enter into cabinet. I don't know how if yeah. it would be legislation or if it would be kept at the local level and yes. and regions would decide on their own. But um, it's a very good question, and yeah. um, I know that it's very concerning for people. How much time does agriculture get in cabinet? <clears throat> Well, I you don't got know. so many governments got I, so many things to deal with. I right? am so passionate about it that um, you know people say, well, do your your a lot of your um, uh, yes. colleagues are from urban areas, but I can tell you, we everybody knows the value of agriculture. Yes. After I've been going on and on about it for the last eight years, they don't <laughs> have stand a chance. All right. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and is the fish farming model getting sort of confusing at the moment for you and taking away your other priorities? It's a main focus right now. This, won't be, this, this program won't till air for four or five weeks, so probably okay. there'll be history by then. May, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's very complicated. Yeah. But um, it's also uh, an issue that, you know, we have to face head on. Yes. There's been controversy about fish farms for the last yeah. 30 years. And so um, the First Nations don't feel that they have yeah. had a role in that. Uh, right. And so you, you, you have to take into account um, the history, but really we're looking at moving forward. So we've yes. committed fully to having authentic relationships and discussions with First Nations. And we what's, what's the First Nations message around fish farming? Well, it's mixed. So yeah. some are supportive of that industry and some aren't. And okay. so you also have to, to add that into the equation. Right. Yeah. And so as we move forward, the most important part is that the federal government ha has holds most of the cards on this right. file. And they have, uh, under the conservatives, have really been um, out of the loop and not have not wanted to be involved. Mm. I've tried over the last two months to start relationships with the ministry yeah. of ocean, fisheries and oceans. Minister Dominique LeBlanc and I are in constant contact right. over this issue. Okay. And so yeah. um, that we're going to have government to government right. talks, which is government to government to government, because it's federal, provincial, and yes. First Nations. It'll be very uh, historic meetings, because that's not the way wow. it's happened. And so challenging, but an issue definitely worth taking on. Yeah. And I think no matter what, um, you know, there's high, high expectations on both sides on what's going to happen. The only thing I can guarantee is that no matter what happens, it'll be better than it is right now. Right. So we will move ahead. Yeah. I don't know how exactly that's going to play yes. out, but it'll be better than it is now. Industry, First Nations, federal government, our government knows status quo isn't good enough on this anymore yes. and something has to change and we're committed to doing so that. So salmon and herring, are they in your portfolio or not? Well, ten sort of. Wild salmon and yes. wild herring. Yeah, it's it's it falls under we promote seafood in my yes. in my ministry, and so it is. But again, okay. that falls under the federal government. Yeah, because some people have been really concerned. If we overfish the herring, mm -hmm. the salmon got nothing to feed on, and, and we, we know what the abundance of fish was like. 80 years ago. It was just right. phenomenal. Yeah. And now we're dealing with 10%. We are. And so we, what um, we have in our mandate is to implement the Cohen Commissions, which is really yes. focused on sockeye salmon right. and the migration routes. And so that's where our focus yes. is right now. So, uh, so you can't have a healthy seafood industry without a healthy fish in the sea to produce that. It's so there's a close true. linkage. There's a huge linkage. And, and there's lots of things that are affecting our salmon runs, climate change. Yes. Um, yeah. logging practices on our salmon bear, around yes. our salmon bearing streams and fish farms and so you have yes. to take into account a balanced approach by looking at everything and yeah. take out the risks as much risk as you can and that's what we're going to do because we have a top priority to protect the health of wild salmon. Yes. So when you when you put your head on the pillow at night can you actually get to sleep or is this endlessly going through you waking up at three in the morning thinking about <laughs> priorities? Um, I, when I put my head on the pillow at night, I, I can sleep okay. because it's, you know, I only get about three hours of sleep. So I have, no, it's not really true. But <laughs> wow. by the end of the day, um, the hours are about seven in the morning till about 10 at night. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so that's a long work day. But the best thing is knowing that when I put the head on the pillow, um, we're doing everything we can to make the yes. province as good as we can. But it's a challenge for family life then. You're not getting family time. Well, that's true, but um, very understanding yes. partners, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that you know when when your partner supports you in yeah. a job like this, they know that you're doing the best that you can yeah. and for the right reasons. And so, even though you elect somebody into office, you elect their support team with you. Right. And um, I consider that in in yeah. a lot of decisions, if there's a chance that I can, um, you know bring my partner to a certain events, right. yeah. then I do it because it might not be what we consider 
quality time exactly, but it's yeah. always interesting. So you've brought a book with you, my suggestion, which yes. you want to share with people. What is it? Well, I well, heard can that you hold it up to the camera so they can, were, there you are, they can um, see it. Yes. looking for a book that maybe I'm reading right now yes. or inspiring. So share with people. I, um, I love food, and so I don't have a lot of time to read, um, you know, yeah. books in depth. But this book is called Food um, Artisans. It's by our good friend Don Genoa, oh, and right, it's yes. about... Um, at different places on Vancouver Island that make different products. And so oh. when I start to feel frustrated or, you know, I feel exasperated over something, yeah. I just sit down and I flip through this book or any other cookbook that yes, I right. might have, and it inspires me to keep working on the things that I, are oh, important to me. Great. Yeah. So to wrap up, why don't you take two minutes and, hmm. and speak straight to camera, okay. as if, okay. no, not me, as a general viewer there, hmm. why does it matter to look after food and farmlands? Off you go. Okay, two <laughs> minutes. Um, so I've always believed that uh, food production was important and as I'm, I'm turning 49 next week and I've noticed uh, how uh, the culture of food creates community. We, I live in an urban area in British Columbia, but as I travel through rural BC, I understand that um, the culture of farming really builds communities in the way that it has an economy that's available, um, it supports kids in schools in those areas, it supports small businesses and a way of life. And so not only is it uh, important to have food and, and increase that food production uh, in general, but if we want to have uh, support our rural communities and have sustainable economies across our province, I think we have to embrace agriculture like we've never done before sustainable agriculture. And um, I don't have to tell Guy that climate change is a huge issue with food growing. And one of the industries that is affected most and probably one of the earliest is agriculture because temperature change, season change, weather, weather change events, it all affects agriculture in a way that um, is, can be quite devastating. So we see around the world different areas that are growing traditional uh, food products might not be available to us anymore. We are a huge importer of goods from California and they are suffering from um, water shortages, saline problems, droughts, and right now fires. And so when you look at our traditional areas of sourcing food start to decline, we have one of the most diverse growing areas. Our whole entire province is uh, made up of different regions that grow different things. And so we just haven't embraced it to its fullest. And so for climate change reasons, for food security reasons, and for economic development, um, I think agriculture has so much potential. That's great. As I see it happening in the Couch and Valley. You know, they're actually rebranding themselves. Canada has a new Provence. Yes, I know. <laughs> and it's the, great. And there's a, there's, you can sense a culture mm. growing, which yeah. the magaz local magazines are just full of I know. foodie things. Everyone's right? interested <laughs> in it. That's right. And I, I couldn't be more proud to be the Minister of Agriculture. And, yeah. Yeah, and I'm thank you for all the work that you've done in the Pleasure. past. In well, the thank, thank you for your leadership thank on you. this whole thank thing. Thank you. And, and for the eight years of, you know, this is a long committed time. You, you've held this commitment. And That's true, but I feel like I had training wheels on, and I'm really glad yeah. that I did because my learning curve wasn't quite as steep That's when I got good. to be the minister. Well, yeah. good luck. Good luck for the months Thank ahead. You. Thanks so much. So, so um, my name is Guy Dauncey. This has been the show called Change the World. My guest has been Lana Popham, Honourable Minister of Agriculture. If you enjoy this kind of show, tune in next week. We'll have more stimulating guests. One of my contributions is this small book called Journey to the Future, a novel set in the year 2032 when people in Vancouver are already living all these solutions bundled together in one and having a whale of a time enjoying it to show that the future can be really great if we make it so. So thanks for watching and, and see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.